morning, everybody. Our reading today comes from Ephesians chapter 4, 11 to 16. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up, until we all reach unity in the faith, and in the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, and blown here and there by every wind of teaching, and by the cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and built itself up in love as each part does its work. Um, now, over the last few weeks, we've been exploring the subject of culture and, and what it is and why it's important. And, and, and while culture is a pretty in, a complex topic, um, I think the simple way to describe it is, is what people do when they get together. Because when we get together, the different ways we respond to each other become the cultures that we celebrate or that we create. And this, this happens to all of us when we meet together, be it in small groups of friends or be it in families or perhaps in age groups or churches or businesses. There are all different ways in which people engage with one another. Um, you can even notice differences in, in bigger groups like towns. Um, Marie and I have lived in three different regions in our lives. And each region had its own culture. Uh, in Wellington, um, and especially where we lived in Parramatta, it was a very transitory community. Um, there were lots of business and government um, workers there, so it wasn't always the easiest place to make good friends because, of course, people come and go. Uh, but when we moved to Mosgiel, just a bit out of Dunedin, it was a bit more settled, a bit more, of a cons a bit more conservative, a little bit more of a farming community. And one of the big cultural differences we noticed was that in Mosgiel, when you were walking down the street, people tended to smile at you and say, G'day, you know, even if they didn't know you. Now, I know someone who'd shifted from Mosgiel to Parramatta, and they noticed this difference straight away. They said, hey, walking around the streets, I kind of felt a bit like people were looking at me like I had leprosy, smiling away at them, and they're just, what the heck's going on here? <clears throat> and that's just one small difference of the differences between cultures and towns. And then there are national cultural differences. Like, for example, what would you say are some of the cultural um, uh, characteristics of New Zealanders? Okay, now you say that, but if you went to New Zealand, you'd have no idea what you're talking about there. So what do you mean by that, Tony? Very good. Excellent. Number eight, why? Okay, well done. Anyone else? She'll be right. What do you mean by that? <laughs> good enough. Okay, sure, yeah, good enough. Okay, yeah, okay. All right, let's try something else. Hmm? Bring a plate. Okay, what does that mean? <laughs> so bring the plate? Okay, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So, okay, all part of the culture, very good. What about people who have been from overseas, people are from England or somewhere like that, or Australia? Friendly and welcoming. Hmm? Friendly, Friendly and welcoming, yeah, okay. Because I think some of the things in our culture we don't always notice, but people are almost... What about you, Frank? You notice anything? Well, Dandles. Dandles? <laughs> Relaxed, yep, okay. Someone said nosy. Nosy? Nosy. Ah, okay. Oh, that's interesting. So, I mean, it's, it's interesting, the whole cultural differences that we've got here. Um, one that I want to talk about for New Zealanders today, though, is a, is a characteristic that um, I think is significant for us, and that's um, independence. A and by independence, I mean learning to rely on yourself. Because I think a lot of New Zealanders, uh, they pride themselves on this. And I guess it comes from us being a country in the bottom of the world. And historically, if you were going to come all the way to live here um, initially, uh, back in the day, you had to be a bit of a pioneer, didn't you? You, know, you couldn't go running every time you needed help because people, you're, you're all kind of stuck by yourself. There weren't that many other people you could rely on. 
And I guess as a New Zealander, you say, hey, independence is actually quite a, a, a positive quality, isn't it? You know, I can look after myself. But I want to suggest that when it comes to contrast, con contra contrasting this part of our culture to the kingdom of heaven, I'm not sure it's as much of a strength as we sometimes think it is. Um, especially in the Bible, independence isn't necessarily a wonderful quality, is it? If you, if you look at through the heroes of the Bible in the Old Testament, it seems that the Bible values dependence, doesn't it? Dependence on who? Dependence on God. Dependence on God first and foremost. Psalm 118 puts it this way. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in humans. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. So God, dependence on God is really significant to the Bible. And you might say, hey, fair enough, Nick, I can, I can cope with dependence on God, just Jesus and me, I can live with that. Well, if that's where you're at this morning, don't get too excited. Because there's another quality that's a significant value in the kingdom of God, and that's as well as dependence, it's interdependence. And interdependence is what happens when we learn to rely on each other. That's right. You could say interdependence is part of the culture of heaven. We all need each other. And this is a very important subject for us to grab hold of as a church. Because if we live in a culture that values independence, it's going to get really uncomfortable to get our heads around learning to rely on one another. One another. Because you'll always be wondering, how can I succeed if my success is dependent on someone who doesn't think like I do? Someone who could possibly let me down. See, if you value independence, it's one thing to say you depend on God because he's God. But it's a lot more challenging to depend on other people. Because I'm sure you know from experience, people are guaranteed to let you down, aren't they? So how do, how, how do we know that God is really into this idea of interdependence? Well, I guess a good place to start is where we left off last week. And one reason we can say that interdependence is part of the culture of heaven is because Jesus commanded it. Because what was that most important command that Jesus left his disciples just before he went to the cross? Love one another. So you were listening. That's good. Oh, not up there yet either, is it? Yo, well done. Very, very proud of you. So my command is this, Matthew 15, 12 to 14. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love there is no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friend, and you are my friends if you do what I command. Love one another. Now just in case you haven't picked this up, it, it's very hard to love people and lay down your life for them if you have a higher value of independence. Because independence, your primary value is yourself, isn't it? Whereas the primary focus on love is others. And Jesus commanded us to love. So in order to do this, we need others. We need people. But that's not all that God has to say about the subject of interdependence. In fact, when we look at the subject of the church in the Bible, this interdependence is exactly how he made the church to function. Let's look again at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 12, where it tells us that Christ gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. And here the Apostle Paul is explaining to the church of Ephesus how God has made leadership to function within the church. And of course, you'll notice those five distinct roles there. Often they're called the five-fold ministries of the church, aren't they? And um, what these are generally understood at is, is specific offices within the body of Christ that should function together to ensure that the church is being built up. So these aren't necessarily giftings like are described in other parts of the, the Bible. These are more like roles or responsibilities that God has gifted certain people with. But these roles, they're all different. And they've all got different perspectives and different priorities. However, according to the Bible, they are all made by God to function together to build up the wider church. So how do these roles work in, in practice? Well, a helpful way I've got to explain this, I stole from a guy, um, a pastor named Danny Silk. But it goes like this. Um, just imagine that was a big bus crash. Um, bus overturned, cars all over the place, people lying all over the road. Some people are running in shock deliriously around the place. 
And then a car happens to drive up, um, carrying a bunch of people, each with a specific five-fold um, ministry gift, and they drive up to the scene. And the first person out the door is the pastor, because the pastor's a wonderful person. <laughs> Very good-looking man. Um, and and what, they, what does the pastor do? Well, the pastor's the practical one. They begin to organise everyone into categories of who's in the most desperate need, like a triage doctor. They look around to ensure that everyone's safe and there's no other dangerous hazards around. They make sure that those who are unable to move are warm and have someone looking after them. They get to know the people on the bus, their names, their families, and everyone loves the pastor because he's the one who cares for them, or she. Um, But that's the pastor. But then after the pastor, of course, out jumps the teacher. So what does the teacher do? Well, the teacher's the theoretical one. They start to look around and look what caused the crash in the first place and what might stop it happening again. The teacher notices the skid marks on the road and, and the weather conditions and the distance the vehicles moved after impact. And they start to develop a theory as to what went wrong. And then the teacher begins to develop a driver education course to ensure that this crash will never happen again. That's the teacher for you. It's the, it's the theoretical one. And then you've got the evangelist. The evangelist jumps out. He's like the salesperson of the group, the invitational one. So she immediately runs out towards those who have wandered far from the bus in shock and draws them back to safety. And as she returns, she notices this large crowd who have come to watch everything going on. And she walks on up to them and says, oh, guys, look around. You know what? There's no guarantees um, that anyone will ever return home safely, is there? In fact, do you guys know where you're going when you're going to die? In fact, the people's response to this message is so strong, the evangelist considers getting a police scanner so she can be ready for the next bus crash. And then there's the prophet. Now, the prophet's not really surprised about the bus crash because they had a dream about it the night before. So, so they're all prepared for this event. But the, the prophet's focus is the supernatural, what's going on in the spiritual. And so they're running out, giving words of encouragement to those who need it. They're calling out the destinies of those around, as well as identifying the spiritual activity in the area. So what have we had so far? We've had the pastor, we've had the teacher, we've had the evangelist, prophet and evangelist. Yep. And then, of course, who's left? The apostle. And actually, it might surprise you to know, the apostle wasn't actually in the car in the first place. Because God had already directed the apostle to be at the very place of the accident before the bus had arrived. They were busy preparing the area for everyone else to help everyone else rapidly respond to the event. And they were there once it happened. They were praying for healing, calling for more people to get involved in the rescue. And they were gifted with a sense of discernment so they could appoint people into leadership roles at the accident. Also, they could move on down to the next accident down the road. It wasn't a very safe street there. So, so in the body of Christ, the apostle is often the initiator. So, so here we have those five roles, pastor, teacher, evangelist, prophet, and apostle. And they all have five very different perspectives, don't they? Five very different ways of looking at the accident and what's the important thing to do. But working together, they get the job done. They all provide leadership in, this, in, a, in a sphere of influence. And... The, and this is, Ephesians is saying, hey, this is how the church ought, ought to operate. This is the kingdom dream, if you like. Different perspectives and skills coming together to glorify Jesus. But at this point, you might be asking the question, well, Nick, that sounds all great, but why does the church not always seem to be functioning in this way? Well, I'd like to suggest that in this country, one of the biggest obstacles we have to stop the church working together like this It's not the type of leaders we've got, and it's not outside things like the secular media or the government or anything like that. I suspect the biggest challenge the church has um, of working, functioning together like this is an independent spirit. We all struggle with the idea of being dependent on people who are different than ourselves, who think differently, who operate differently. However, if we're not fully committed to this idea of working together and loving one another, and allowing God to sort out our rough edges can be very difficult to see how that fivefold ministry can work, can't it? Because we become the ones who decide who we want to work with and who we don't want to work with. And when we decide the people that we want to work with and don't, what generally happens is we tend to pick the people who are like us, don't we? Have you noticed that? 
And another name for that is tribalism. And I, I think tribalism is rife throughout the church in this country. And this is why you see churches that gravitate towards things like pastoral care or biblical accuracy or signs and wonders. And they all kind of have their little groups that kind of meet together. But no one recognises, uh, or you have evangelists setting up ministries outside the church because they either don't feel appreciated or they refuse to work with people who see things differently from them. And I'd say no one recognises the apostles God's placed in our midst because generally apostles aren't always that easy to pick in the first place. And so no wonder the church isn't kind of operating as, as, as the Bible says because we fully ignore that uh, the, the God tells us to develop the full package. The prophet, the pastor, the teacher, the evangelist and the apostle all working together. The supernatural, the practical, the theoretical, the invitational and the initiator. These are all parts of the puzzle of who we are. So how do we go about doing this? It's all, I've, I've kind of given you a problem here, haven't I? All right. So how do we go about kind of responding to this? And be, how do we become a church that brings all these things together? Because often when it comes to churches and leadership, I think there's a bit of a tendency to tell ourselves, hey, perhaps it's just because we don't have the right leaders. That's our problem. If only we had a biblical hero like Joshua or David, then we'd be right. And I struggle with that way of thinking because, A, I'm a leader, and I'm not at that level, and I don't know that many who are. But more importantly, I think, it actually abdicates our responsibility as the church. Because the truth of the matter is that whether we believe it or not, God is the one who appoints our leaders. And we've got a lot less control over that matter than we think. And when I think, when it comes to this fivefold ministry in the church, it's, it's important to recognise that God doesn't hand out pastors and prophets and evangelists and teachers and apostles willy-nilly. He's actually looking to send them to communities of people, of churches, who are committed to having the right attitude. Not people who have an independent spirit, putting their wants and needs above everything else, but people who have a determination to love those around them no matter how different they are from each other. And people who have a commitment to honour others. And people who pe treat people with the respect that comes from being a person made in the image of God. And people who are willing to put away aside their egos. Because let me tell you, when it comes to the church, it doesn't matter how gifted you are, and e the ego will be a killer. And actually, James puts it this way. He says, who's wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by a good life, by deeds coming in humility that come from wisdom. But if you harbour bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, don't boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual and demonic. For wherever you have earth, envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. What this is saying is when you have a part of an organisation that's run for the benefit of someone's ego or someone's pride, whether that be a church, a club, a business, a family, whatever it is, then you don't need to dig down too hard to find out that there is a disorder down there that's evil and unspiritual and even demonic. And I can tell you what, as someone who likes his church history, I know so many stories of men and women who are incredibly gifted by God, but their potential was spoiled by their ego. But listen to what the passage goes on to say. But the, the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, and considerate and submissive and full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. And peacemakers like this who sow peace reap a harvest of righteousness. This passage is talking about our attitude, isn't it? It's talking about love. It's talking how we honour those around us. And that is what the culture of the kingdom of the heaven looks like. And when we commit ourselves to becoming these, these types of people, then everything else will flow. The harvest of righteousness will flow. The blessings, the fivefold ministries, everything flows from this. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. So let me encourage you as we close this message today and move on to the communion. Um, let's, let's never forget to build our ability to love. Whether that be love in our homes, in our workplaces, or, or in our clubs, in our schools, and especially a love here in church. Sow in love for the people around you. 
May you be known as a person who cares for others and honour those, whether you, they might seem important or not. Look to add value wherever you can. And God will bring the harvest in. I remember Julie talking about healing rooms. Um, she said, hey, whether people or not come, come to our place and get healed, hey, that's up to God. But if people leave our place feeling loved and cared for, then we've won. We've done all that God has called us to do. So in our culture, love and honour is the key that everything else sits upon. Because when we have these elements as a foundation in our lives together, then what we're actually doing is offering God something valuable that he can work with. And that's really what we want to offer him, isn't it? So let's pray. Father, I, the, the words of the song come to me, I will build my life upon your love. It's a firm foundation. So, Father, I pray that our love for others would be built upon your love for us. Lord, that we would grow more and more in the image of the way that you love us. And founded upon that, Lord, that we would welcome all the gifts and abilities that you wish to unfold in this church. Because, Lord, we do want the full package. We want the supernatural. We want the practical. We want the theoretical and the invitational. And the, initi and, and, and the initial initiators. Lord, please forgive us, Lord, when our own egos and our self-importance actually get in the way of what you're trying to do. And Lord, forgive us and cleanse us from our iniquities. That Jesus, you would be the Lord of our church and the Lord of our lives. Lord, that the culture that we have here as your people would replicate the culture of heaven. And all the people said...